Um, I would like to invite Dr. Kieran in order to be able to give us the final reflections for the day. So good, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much, uh, Ariane, for that introduction. Um, so it's uh, well, it's been a, it's been a long and uh, and fascinating and intense day for a lot of us. It's the uh, it's the first time that there has been this uh, focus on innovative models and new approaches in the, the day before Scientific Day, and uh, and in fact, at one point, I even was thinking, we couldn't we call this the unscientific day to distinguish it from tomorrow's Scientific Day. <laughs> Um, because it's not just about science, just, and it's not just a medical audience. It's the first time we've got everyone here together, ops, uh, logistics, uh, medical, uh, tech, all the domains together. And I think what the day has shown us, in, in fact, is that uh, we can be scientific, uh, no matter who's involved, even a panel of logisticians who we, we, we give them a hard, uh, hard time, we <laughs> regard them as unsystematic, and they don't evaluate what they do. But actually, here, we can show that uh, we've shown that we can actually learn, we can innovate, and we can actually carry that forward and see, see what, uh, what lessons we can learn and, and how we can make programs better as a result. Um, before I, before I, I sum up uh, a couple of, couple of, uh, sort of key messages from the day, I just wanted to say that uh, in the end, there have been 90 countries watching, uh, watching the, the day. And in addition to the countries mentioned earlier, there, they, there are Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Russia, Algeria, Burundi, Colombia, DRC, Lesotho, Romania, South Sudan, to mention just a few. So uh, really, I think we're encompassing more or less all continents there. Um, and there have been a, a, there's been a lot of activity uh, on, on Twitter. There's been a lot of questions coming in. Um, we've had a lot of people viewing from Monash in Australia. So thank you very much for your, your interest. They're probably asleep now because of the time not because the day tailed off, but... Uh, <laughs> um, and of course, uh, MSF Zimbabwe, lots of comments there. Lancet Infectious Disease, uh, thank you again for insightful comments. And Epieta, various Epieta people have been watching and mapping groups as well. So there's been a lot, of, uh, a lot of participation, a lot of interaction. In fact, it seems to have risen to 2,265 unique viewers today only from those 90 countries. So an enormous uh, um, online following. So which, uh, yeah, and so congratulations to the team as well that have put all this together. Now, I think I'd like to just uh, run, run, run through, uh, well, maybe first recap a few of the messages from today before I, 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 I finish by giving a couple of my own thoughts, because I have the privilege of being able to do that here. Um, the Arian sort of, I think very well laid out the, uh, the, the, the theme at the beginning by, by talking about the fact that innovation and adaptation is, is really at the center of humanitarian work. We're always having to adapt to new situations and we need to find solutions to new problems and, and changes. Um, and often there's a, it's a, it's a, there is a challenge in taking things that work in one setting and, and, uh, and trying to make them work in other settings. And uh, a lot of the innovation is about that. Ken, Kenneth uh, gave a, a talk on, um, on big data, but also small data as well. And I think the fundamental message was the centrality of data in innovation. Um, lots of data enables us to do not only more of the same, it enables us to do things that we, we didn't think were possible uh, before. And the example of tracking Ebola cases to transport hubs uh, using mobile phone data, uh, this, this can enable us to intervene in ways that are, are likely to be much more effective. So I think it, it shows the value of, uh, of, 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 it shows the value of, of creative ways of using data, but also that uh, data is the, is the foundation for finding innovative solutions to problems. So using data itself can, can, be, can be the innovation, but having good data is essential for innovation. We had a, a, a wide-ranging discussion on, on mapping. I mean, I think it was very clear the, the profound impact that good maps can have on you know, our emergency responses, um, not only making our interventions more, more relevant, but also helping us to use resources effectively. So Sylvie talked about the experience of setting up a GIS unit, and particularly the, the lesson they'd learned that having field GIS officers to work closely with epidemiologists was, were, was a very important part of their model. That, uh, to, to, to make the, 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 the GIS, ver the, the, to use the GIS capacity to its full and to make it very relevant to field problems. Pete talked about base mapping by communities of volunteers working together to map, uh, uh, proactively to map um, 
uh, unmapped areas to improve emergency response. This was the Missing Maps project, and and there was a there was a feel of there was a real feel of empowerment in this, in that uh, uh, Pete talked about communities where people had uh, had ownership of their data. This was not simply a, an entirely a, a foreign uh, intervention. In fact, people were involved in 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 the process of mapping, which meant that people were involved in the solution to, the, to their problem. And, uh, and Laura, I think, took that also further by talking about the fact, the fact that they had empowered local GIS officers with smartphones to, to map very rapidly uh, unmapped areas and achieve immediate uh, impact in terms of operations. And then we moved into a very different area. I think this was the, the, the long view, innovation in meeting chronic health needs. When Fuad uh, talked about the new, the new protracted crises, the unsolved wars, the, um, often in middle-income countries with cr he heavy chronic disease burden, and particularly talking about Syria. Uh, he made the point that more people died for, uh, have died from NCDs than, than, than trauma or direct uh, uh, war wounds, and, uh, and hence the need for new models to address the, the, this, this incredible burden of NCDs in these populations. Beatrice to to told us about how they had reproduced field conditions of the field conditions of Dagley Camp in a lab to respond to a very specific question, can insulin be kept out of the fridge here in our setting, in our camp? And concluded that as long as we keep it in the shade, that we allow it to cool down at night, it can be kept up to a month at up to 37 degrees. I mean, this is, a, this is groundbreaking for the work that MSF does and other organizations. I think how many times have, have we as, as clinicians in the field been frustrated at not being able to give insulin to patients because we know that uh, they don't have a fridge. So the only patients who get insulin are the ones who live next to the hospital and can come in every day to the clinic. I mean, how many people have experienced that frustration? And this is a game changer. It's an astonishing, astonishing d development, which we were lucky to hear about today. And then Emily talked about a very different problem, the problem of the very heavy HR requirements of managing chronic diseases and what, what can be learned from the HIV model there, the way that we've established treatment clubs to deal with the the, 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 the fact that the regularity with which people need to come back to get their medications, but don't necessarily need very intensive follow-up each time. And the model seems to have uh, to, uh, to achieved very good acceptance for other, other chronic diseases as well. And then both Philippa and John talked about the uh, two models of care to address this, uh, this overwhelming need amongst refugees in open settings across, along the Syrian border where the health systems are not equipped to deal with that massive influx. And uh, both pre presented a, a multidisciplinary team model with task shifting and show, showing not only reasonable outcomes, but also, which I thought was very important, where there were problems, such as the default await rate, learning and ev uh, an evolving approach had been built into these programs. So these programs are both learning, they're both evaluating themselves, they're, they're learning and they're adapting. And that's what has to happen in a situation where we don't have that experience of managing these chronic diseases in these settings before. I think John also showed that uh, motivational interviewing could be, could be feasible to achieve behavioral change, even in this context where people are facing very significant socioeconomic uh, uh, barriers to, to, uh, to, to achieve that, that sort of uh, change. And then moving on to the, the afternoon, we, um, I'll go straight to the extreme uh, environments and come back to the others in the end. I, um, Robin gave a very nice definition of in extreme environments, which was anywhere that your flip-flops melt, <laughs> essentially, which was the common feature of, uh, of all of these, uh, all, all of the presentations. But here, the, 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 the Isaac presented the promise of drones for sample transport for TB. Again, a very specific question, how to get a TB sample from the health center to the lab as quickly as possible. We heard about a technique from Jean-Yves to visualize the interior of boreholes to allow targeted solutions. And we heard about the two solutions for the, the problem of achieving efficient data capture in Ebola and making the most of each minute in the high-risk zone. So again, very, very specific problems. And two solutions which had some, had some commonalities, um, but as was said at the end, both took a slightly different approach in the end, one aiming at a, a sort of more rapid deployable solution and one looking quite, in, a little, in some ways, a little bit to the future and actually developing a, a, a solution that has multiple other applications. In fact, this is the same for both of them, and it's going to be an inter interesting to see how these two solutions evolve in the future. 
We had a very interesting demo session as well, Laura talking about the, the high definition real time communication application, JITMeet, Lika on the, on the uh, online tool for assessing and monitoring learning needs and capacities, and, and Georges, the agile knowledge management system, Graspeo. I think that um, a few, to sum up a few impressions, a few themes that I think kept coming up and really struck me from the day was that in every case, innovation was driven by real humanitarian problems. All the presentations today were an attempt to address a specific issue, in, and, and it was a, an issue that arose in that field. And, and it was clear that innovation is happening on all fronts. It's not just, it's not just medical, it's not just opera operations, it's not just logistics. It's, in fact, it's everybody, and it's not just headquarters or field, it's both. And it's not just staff, it's even beneficiaries as well. And innovation clearly actually does not need to involve high tech. Sometimes it's a new way of thinking, new way of approaching a problem. Sometimes it's even simplification. And sometimes it's even de-technologizing. I think, as Arian said, sometimes it's not needing a fridge anymore, which, which is an innovation. Through the panel discussion, we, uh, we, we heard a lot of thoughts about how to enable a culture of innovation. Accessing, making use of data, good internal communication, innovation management processes, a focus on change management. Making partnerships with, with corporate and academic institutes. Finding ways to identify field priorities and meet them, but also encouraging field, field innovation. And then, of course, making sure your innovation is priority driven and is not opportunistic. And the need for ethical guidance to innovation in that way, maybe we should see it a little bit in the same category as research, because here we are doing things that, uh, for which we don't have clear evidence. So I think in. In summary, I, I asked a colleague uh, what innovation was for them, and they said it was a new and different way of doing things that gets implemented and creates value or impact. To do that, to, to, to have impact, to create value, we need to evaluate. And I think this was mentioned today. Well, it was probably mentioned by me, but uh, um, these, these innovations, we must, we must make sure they're, they're working. There are some fantastic ideas that have, that, that have been presented here. And we need to evaluate. We need to learn from them. We need to keep evolving those ideas. And we need to then share those findings, as has happened here today. Because I think that what's clear is that there, are, there, there is incredible innovation going on in the movement, at the field, level of the field, at the level of everywhere. And, uh, but by evaluating, by rigorously evaluating and sharing those findings, we can actually uh, we can actually spread, share those and spread them to the whole movement and well beyond. So thank you very much to everybody for your participation, your, your, your questions, your patience, your, and your fantastic presentations. I, before I stop speaking, I just have a couple of announcements about tomorrow. In fact, there's even one about tonight. Join us in a drink immediately after this. Join us for a drink in the atrium outside. Um, tomorrow is day two. It's the medical research from the frontline day. So please bring your badge and, badge and booklets with you. And remember that uh, tomorrow is also the scientific day in New Delhi. Uh, so this will be streamed live online tomorrow. So this is th these, these two days are happening at the same time. If evaluation forms, please deposit those at the reception or hand them to a volunteer. And if you need CPD accreditation, please sign up at reception. And if you're not joining us tomorrow, please hand in badges at reception. So thank you very much, everyone. And let's go and have a drink.